Well, Ryan joins us today. He is the CEO of Granite Shares ETFs. Well, welcome back to Kitco. It's a pleasure to have you again. Thanks, David. Great to be back. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Interesting slew of events this week, starting from the Fed announcing tapering later this month on Wednesday. And of course, today on Friday, we had jobs numbers coming in stronger than expected. 531 jobs gained on the non-farm payroll side, which is higher than the consensus estimate. Of course, the unemployment rate also came down uh, lower than uh, lower than expected, actually. So 4.6% was the latest reading. 4.8% was last month's. So the labor market is improving, at least on the surface. And we have the Fed announcing tapering. So they're also acknowledging the acceleration of the uh, economic growth, or so it seems. Are they right to taper now? Yeah, I think it was pretty well telegraphed, David. Um, you know, the, the number that we had, the provisional numbers that came out on Wednesday, I think kind of opened the door you know, for the tapering to happen, at least the announcement that they're going to reduce or start tapering this month, you know, $15 billion a month, um, or it probably takes us into June, July next year before the taper is, is fully, fully ended. Yes. Um, there's obviously left some room for wiggle room, of course, if something happens. But look, the, the basic message, I think, and you've seen that in the jobs report today, is that you know, it's the, the economy is very strong. I mean, on the on the hiring front, everywhere I look, I see help wanted signs. You know, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to a bar, you can't go to any kind of service venue without seeing signs of people just desperate for workers. And so it's no surprise to me that um, we've got the numbers that we're seeing today. And I think that will only continue as clearly the the remnants of the virus die down, or at least um, are able to, uh, our you know, ability to handle the virus gets a lot better. It's kind of a dangerous sign, no pun intended, when you see signs up for wanted workers, right? Because what, what needs to happen, Will, is they either they need to raise wages sufficiently to motivate people to go back into the workforce, those that haven't you know, re-entered the workforce, or certain businesses will have to operate at you know, half capacity, maybe not even operate at all. I've heard of some cases where small businesses have to shut down, not because there's no demand, but because they can't, they just can't operate. And so Look, that's happening all over the place. And yeah. you see, you know, that in terms of coffee shops, in terms of restaurants, um, you know, it, the list goes on. Um, but, you know, that that's one thing when I, mean, I was in Florida at the end of last week, and, you know, the amount of uh, people that were telling me that, you know, you have restaurants that only open certain days of the week, as opposed to, you know, before when you open every day of the week or reduced hours for coffee shops. I mean, it, it's just, it's a story you, you're hearing all the time. They just can't get the people. So what's, what's, what's next then? Do you, are we going to see uh, reduced uh, growth from, from that side or per, perhaps, uh, like I mentioned, much higher inflation rates because wages will have to go up? What do you think is a more likely outcome? Well, I think at the moment, David, it's higher inflation. Um, so I do think that there's some of this still is, you know, the pandemic related, you know, government stimulus or government, um, you know, unemployment uh, programs that are still kind of in the process of running off in different places. Um, so there is still a factor there. Um, but as we've already seen, I mean, people, minimum wage is going up and employers are raising wages kind of across the board to try and get people in the door, try and incentivize people to work. So right now, I mean, that's part of the reason why we've got the highest inflation numbers we've seen since the 1970s. And so the immediate impact to me is higher inflation. Mm -hmm. Last year during COVID, when everybody was staying at home, we had a surge in the savings rate. So people had, well, people were flush with cash and that's why they went out and started spending right at the start of the reopening. We saw restaurants, bars, uh, services raise their prices for a lot of reasons, you know, supply chain issues and also because of higher demand. Do you think that demand, that higher demand is sustainable now that we're a month and a, a year and, and, you know, and, and a couple months after COVID and now that things are starting to normalize? Well, I mean, that, that is a, there's a massively key question. Um, and, you know, I, I guess nobody knows um, at the moment. The demand is there because, like you say, people are, you know, people do have cash. They are willing to spend. People are looking to, you know, to, to, to take part in experiences that maybe they lost out on, you know, over the last couple of years. But the consequence or the flip side of that is the prices are going up. Now, some things are going to be stay, you know, staples that people just have to buy, you know, whatever the price almost. But I think if it's more discretionary items, you could see pullback in demand for some of those things. 
Um, but at the moment, the demand looks strong. Um, and you know, I think that as long as companies can absorb those inflationary pressures and consumers are willing to pay, um, it can keep on going for some time. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about market impacts then. Uh, starting with actually earlier in the week, let's start talking about Fed first before we talk about today's data. So on Wednesday, as you know, uh, when the Fed announced tapering for later this month, the U.S. dollar index fell sharply after the announcement. Gold um, moved up a little bit, but then came back down. So on the day, it was kind of down and flat. Uh, we saw some action uh, later this week, but uh, generally, I think gold investors are disappointed um, in gold's performance, especially considering the weakness of the U.S. dollar. Uh, was, was gold's performance in line with your expectations, you think? Well, I think that um, certainly yesterday was a big day. It was the biggest day that we've seen in gold for, for quite some time. Um, yes. looks, like, looks like there's a, there's a decent up move you know, today as well. And sometimes that's what happens with gold is that you know, it's the actual announcement which creates the catalyst to move up. It's not the expectation, but the actual announcement. And so I think maybe, maybe we'll see, but maybe that announcement by the Fed that tapering has actually started, as you hear, maybe that is the, the catalyst which can drive gold higher. But for me, at least, you know, in the shorter term for gold, I think that what we're really waiting for to drive prices higher is a acknowledgement by the market more broadly that there's a problem with inflation. I think right now, the market, obviously, the only reason we can have all-time high stock markets is that the market by and large buys into the Fed narrative that inflation is transitory. It's a short-term problem, it will go away quickly. And I think if, they, if that turns out to be wrong, or the longer, obviously, the inflation persists at these levels, mm -hmm. I think that the more there'll be acknowledgement that there's a problem. And then when people acknowledge there's a problem, there are not many hiding places. And I think gold will be one of the, one of the ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, let me propose an alternative theory, and feel free to disagree with me if you like. But perhaps the market doesn't think that inflation is transitory so much that that they think that gold is no longer the best vehicle to hedge against inflation. Maybe the market does believe that inflation is here to stay, but they see better things to use to hedge against that inflation, whether it be energy, stocks, or perhaps even cryptocurrencies. What do you think? I think that the only thing you could probably say, which is new, um, because obviously nothing else really has changed um, other than you know, the tools you can use to fight against inflation in the portfolio. The only thing that's really new is cryptocurrencies. And so from that perspective, yes, of course, you've heard you know, a lot of chatter around Bitcoin and other particular cryptos um, being able to act as a hedge against inflation. I guess that's really just down to somebody's belief if they really think that, that that's the case. I mean, so far, the volatility has been very high um, and we just don't have any kind of empirical evidence over the long run that you know, a currency, a cryptocurrency can act as a legitimate hedge against inflation. Now. That being said, it's not going to stop people from you know, buying it and holding it on that basis. But I think outside of crypto, the toolkit hasn't changed. You know, your weapons to fight against inflation are still the same as they always are. And I think gold, I mean, no doubt broad commodities, for example, um, has seen a lot of inflows. That's been a big you know, beneficiary of the inflation argument. Tips, naturally, a lot of people will, will go to. But I think gold as well. It's just at the moment, I still see much more risk on kind of behavior. In other words, people buying stocks, people buying uh, other riskier assets um, yeah. versus really kind of accepting, hey, we need to be a bit more defensive here. Well, other base metals and commodities have performed much better than gold this year. I mean, while inflation has ticked up this year, gold has not. So objectively speaking, it hasn't really been working so far for gold as an inflation hedge in 2021. Things like copper, for example, went up a lot. Was that because of the inflationary aspect or were there other aspects, other factors pushing up base metals like copper? Yeah, I think it's, it's really more a supply demand issue um, when it comes to metals like copper, obviously, that really are key in terms of the global economy. And so that to me was purely about or, or is, I should say, because it's ongoing, um, the recovery, the global economic recovery. Um, from the pandemic and increased demand versus uh, supply, which has been curtailed. And, and again, over the many, many years, you know, lack of capital expenditure within the space to bring on more supply. So if you look at the base metals, really everything has performed incredibly well this year. And um, probably really the only standout exception is iron ore, which is down you know, quite considerably. Um, but that's more of a Chinese issue than anything else. But 
If you look across the commodity complex, whether it's energy based metals or agriculture, nearly mm -hmm. everything has had a great year. Okay. If someone were to ask you, hey, uh, Will, look, uh, can, you, can you help me out here? I know nothing about gold. Why should I buy gold? What is the purpose that it serves for my portfolio? What would you say? Well, to me, the gold is like a permanent piece of real estate, right? That you have, I think everybody should have an allocation to gold in the portfolio. And to me, gold is not a get rich quick scheme. So I wouldn't think of gold in the same way as you think of some other riskier assets. Gold is defensive, it's a store of value, and it's a different return stream from other assets in the portfolio, which are mainly going to be equities and bonds. Um, so think of gold as being something that's uncorrelated to mm -hmm. equity markets and to bond markets. And that's the real value. It's something that is a hedge against the dollar or the weakness uh, of yes. the dollar. And so to me, you always want to have a bit of ballast in the portfolio in case something goes wrong. And so equity market sells off, the bond market sells off, there's this inflation pressures, other things. I think having a piece of gold, an allocation to gold in the portfolio um, yeah. is always something that's, that's a sensible thing. So you're absolutely right. It does hedge against the dollar and it is a diversifier against other assets like bonds and stocks. But interestingly, when there is a major flash crash, if you will, like last, last March, for example, everything moves down together. I mean, the, the, the correlation between asset classes becomes one. And so we see stocks fall, gold fall with it, and then, and then a recovery takes place. So would you, would you consider gold a hedge against equity volatility in that sense? Yeah, but I think people have to understand why that happens. And so gold is money, right? Gold is something that's redeemable all over the world. You know, gold is gold. And what happens is when people hold gold and there's a liquidity crisis or any kind of market meltdown, you know, like we saw in March, or like we saw in 2008, the first thing people do is they get margin called for mm -hmm. the more riskier parts of their book or the assets, the more riskier assets in their book sell off, you know, the widest or the quickest and the furthest. And so they need cash. And what do they do? Most of the time, they're light on cash in the portfolio, but clearly if you have cash, use a margin call, and then you sell your highest grade assets, i.e. gold, in order to meet those margin calls, in order to service um, the, or, or, or insulate the portfolio from those falls. What we see happening is that's what is the original or the, the first kind of flush in terms of why gold moves down is because people are selling it to generate cash in portfolios. But after that happens, then people realize, hey, I need, I need gold in my portfolio. I need to own this. I don't know where the market's going. And so then there's a wave of buying, which then moves the price back up. And that's what we saw in 2008, where gold sold off mm -hmm. originally for those reasons, again last year. And I think that will always be the case that it's a blessing and a curse in a way that your know, gold on the one hand um, is a hedge against these kind of events. But at the same time, it's one of the highest quality assets in the world. And so people are going to use that um, to their advantage if they've got losses elsewhere in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that Granite Shares also offers exposure to other commodities like platinum, for example. So let's talk about the other commodities for a minute. We've talked about gold as a hedge against inflation and equities. How would you perceive um, the other commodities, the other metals, uh, in terms of their purpose in a portfolio? And finally, their performance in your in your outlook. Well, silver is very similar to gold, so I don't think it's I don't think it's um, really possible for silver to have a great year um, in a market where the gold price is not going up. Also, so I think silver is just a more volatile version of gold, and so for an outlook, you know, you need gold to go up. I think for silver to go up as well. The other metals are very different. So you mentioned platinum. You know, platinum struggled this year largely because of the auto. What's happening in the auto industry? Um, specifically the supply chain concerns, because the biggest amount of demand for platinum comes from autos um, in the catalytic converters. And so the car sales, cars, if we're not selling enough cars, that impacts the demand for platinum. So that metal struggled this year, you know, palladium to a lesser degree, because it's, there's more of a, uh, a supply shortage, more of a, a squeeze in that market. However, I think with the supply chains opening up, you know, hopefully that is one part 
of the economy that is relatively transitory. Again, there's no overnight fix for what's going on in terms of the global supply chains. But I do think that that will start to ease a little bit next year. And so hopefully mm -hmm. that will be positive for some of these metals that have been beaten down a bit on the back of these supply chain concerns. And platinum is probably the number one um, in terms of metals that have been beaten up because of it. So you're saying that the supply chain issue could be resolved by next year, which means we'll no longer have chip shortages, which means that the used car industry is going to suffer a little bit while people can finally buy new cars. Is, is, that, is, that, is that kind of the, the, the logic here? I, well, I did say resolved. I think, I think okay. it will certainly get easier or easier. All right. ease next week, uh, next year, okay. sorry. And, you know, I mean, hopefully it does resolve itself, but I think some of these issues are... are a bit deeper, run a bit deeper than some of the things you read about in the news. And so I think um, I do expect to get uh, those supply chains to get a bit easier next year. And therefore, that I think would be positive for metals like platinum. Well, speaking of cars, I mean, uh, you've obviously, of course, heard the news. Hertz just ordered, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but a lot of Teslas. 100,000. OK, it was the largest order on record. And so um, we're seeing we're seeing mass adoption of EVs happening Right, be right before our eyes. What's that going to do for the metals complex? Well, it will do wonders for the metals that we need in EVs um, in particular. And so, you know, any metal that is involved in, and, and I should say not just today's battery technology, but the future battery technology, because that's evolving all the time. So right now, you know, whereas lithium ion batteries seem to be, well, they're the dominant market share, if you will. Um, but that may not be the case in a few years' time, because obviously there's a huge part of innovation to try and get those batteries more and more efficient, more and more effective. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned a good point, David, because we're you know, coming up now in a time when you know, the UK has come out and said that they're banning sales of internal, yeah. internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030, European Union as a whole by 2035. And then here in the States, obviously, with New York and California, signing up to the 2035 date as well. So that's not that long um, from where we are today before you're not going to be able to buy a gasoline car or a diesel car. So there is a big push into these alternative technologies, EVs specifically. Um, but I think hydrogen is going to be another, another um, alternative energy source in the vehicle market. That's something that uh, has a lot of money being spent on the technology there. Um, something that benefits platinum, for example. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the metals that you need for these new technologies um, to bring about this transition to EVs, transition to a, a carbon-free or at least a, a reduced carbon world, um, I think is the, is the next super cycling commodities. Just on that note, the uh, 2030 and 2035 deadlines, are those, like you said, they're just around the corner. Are those realistic, do you think? you think people can actually meet those deadlines or are they going to have to push it back somehow? I mean, who knows? I mean, you're talking <laughs> about you're talking about politicians and, and government policy. Um, but you know, one thing we do know is that you know Tesla is the dominant player um, in the EVs. The market cap of Tesla speaks for itself. So if you're if you're a car company, I'm guessing you're looking at that, thinking whatever they're doing, we got to do more of it. And if mm -hmm. that's making EVs, we're doing. And you, and you obviously see these see these announcements all the time from everybody from the big European manufacturers to the big US manufacturers like Ford and GM, et cetera. Everybody's getting in on the EV game. Um, and you know, I yeah. think that there's, there's a good reason. And I, I guess I don't have any reason to say that it won't be met, but at the same time, it's really, it's not far away. That's right. So let's put all this together then, Will. What is your outlook for 2022 in terms of the commodity space? Which is your preferred commodity from an investment viewpoint? And I'm putting in gold and silver into the commodity category. Well, I think next year, I mean, to me, what, is, what, is, what are we really talking about? We're talking about the reopening of the global economy. Yes. And I think in that perspective, the base metals or the pro-cyclical commodities, I think, will likely continue to do very well. I think the problems that we're seeing in energy markets um, can still continue into next year, or will continue into next year. That means elevated uh, energy prices. I think what's happening with the demand for metals, just the broader reopening, not just with EVs and uh, decarbonization, but with just simple demand for all sorts of products which need copper, which need nickel, which need all these base metals. Um, I think that will increase. 
And so those are probably the two areas I think are probably stand to do best next year. Obviously, if there's an inflation surprise, um, then you know gold can do very well. But at the moment, mm -hmm. I think it's more about the pro-cyclical commodities for next year. Excellent. Well, excellent thoughts as always. Thank you so much for coming back on Kitco. Thank you, David. Pleasure. Thank you for watching Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.